five and three, two. Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll come back to another session of Smile Shadowers Virtual Shadowing. Uh, my name is Quang. I'm here with Kelly and Diane. And today we have Dr. Albari from sunny Abu Dhabi. And Dr. <laughs> floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I think this is the first time I ever lecture to non-dentists. So if I speak a little bit too much into details with dentistry, so please stop me, ask any questions whenever. And um, all right, let's move on. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, what I did in the past, what I currently do, my education path, it's a little um, unconventional. Um, any, I'm going to try to give some advice, uh, but it might not pertain to you guys in particular because I did not do undergrad in the States. Um, and of course, talk about prosthodontics, my specialty, and implant surgery. All right, so a little bit about myself. I... Uh, I uh, attended I attended dental school the first time. Yes, I say the first time because I went to dental school twice in Poland and the second time around in New York. And then I did my residency and my master's at Harvard. And I'm currently in private practice in Abu Dhabi. And uh, I also started a startup while I was in residency for medical conferences, being medical and dental being that my brother is also a bariatric surgeon. And um, yeah, and I'm licensed in the Emirates. I'm licensed in Massachusetts, New York, and Canada. And so I grew up, I was born and raised in the Emirates, uh, particularly um, Abu Dhabi and the suburbs of Abu Dhabi. But I know the glamour is all in Dubai. A lot of times people ask me, where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from the Emirates be like, where, where's that? Like Dubai? Like, yeah, I got you. Yes, yes, Dubai. I know Dubai. So yeah, um, living here is pretty nice. It's kind of warm all the time, a little bit too warm sometimes. Uh, but I grew up here. I went to high school here. And then after high school, I uh, moved to Poland. But uh, being that I wanted to be a dentist right off the bat, I kind of uh, did not want to do undergrad in the States because uh, I figured that I would not be guaranteed admission to dental school right away. But I already knew that I wanted to be a dentist. So I uh, decided to go to Europe. And so I went to Europe and did dental school there. But why? Um, basically because of this. Um, dentistry is always, always top 100 best jobs, best paying jobs. Uh, best jobs in healthcare. And as you can see here, this is this year's uh, updates. You can see dentist, orthodontist, oral maxillofacial surgeon, and prosthodontist are always in the top 10 and uh, the top 100 best jobs, best paying jobs, and best jobs in healthcare. So obviously, you, we are all attracted to that. And, and with that comes passion. You start loving what you do and you start loving your life, basically. <laughs> um, so I moved to Poland in 2017. Um, I put a lot of goofy photos for you guys. Uh, this is my first year of dental school. And then I graduated after five years in 2012 with a doctor of dental surgery. But um, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you're not a graduate of the US, you're not licensed in the US. So obviously my plan was always to go to the States. So then I moved there and I uh, moved to New York City where I did my dental school in, um, in New York. So that's my first year, super excited. Then the excitement goes away towards the end because you get the life sucked out of you during dental school. <laughs> so graduated with a doctor of dental surgery and then that's where I moved to Boston. Uh, that's my first day there with my co-residents. Um, it was a three-year program where you uh, train as a prosthodontist and you, at the same time, you simultaneously get your master's 
in medical sciences, in oral biology, you can do it in whatever basically field you want. And uh, so I did that obviously throughout the way I lectured a lot, I presented a lot in multiple, multiple places, uh, nationally and internationally uh, while I was in residency. And that's how I kind of like picked up this uh, lecturing thing. I really liked it, I really enjoyed it. And I actually started a startup um, where I host medical lectures and dental lectures. Uh, I bring lecturers from all over to the Middle East uh, to give their lectures. And this is basically it. It's a MedStar. I hosted a bunch of lectures. This is before COVID. Um, and then we kind of like put it on hold for now. And then I joined private practice in uh, our practice over here, al Bahri Dental and Orthodontic Center. Um, it's uh, basically my dad's practice. And so I kind of joined him and changed things up, uh, brought some new blood in here, young blood in here. And uh, it's been going pretty nicely. This is my clinic, more or less. Um, this is my beautiful little niece um, in my office in the clinic. And uh, I just uh, opened my second branch uh, in Abu Dhabi as well. And uh, this is still not completely open. We're still under construction, but we're almost there. So uh, dentistry. So if anybody's interested in dentistry, you know that there's 12 specialties. There's dental public health, there's endodontics, there's OMF pathology, radiology, surgery, oral medicine, uh, orthodontics, pediatric dentistry, periodontics, prosthodontist, um, dental anesthesiology, and oral facial pain. The two newest specialties are actually or, uh, oral facial pain and oral medicine. They used to be programs, but not specialties, but the ADA just approved them as specialties as well. So obviously today we're gonna to be talking about prosthodontics and what that is. So prosthodontics is basically a dental specialty pertaining to the diagnosis, treatment planning, rehabilitation and maintenance of oral function, comfort, appearance and health of patients with clinical conditions associated with missing or deficient teeth or maxillofacial tissues by using biocompatible substitutes. And that's exactly what I'm gonna to touch up on. Uh, those substitutes. As a prosthodontist, it comes from the word, you're using prosthetics. You're always, you're, you're replacing things with prosthetics and it's basically our tools. So we basically have very limited tools. Um, and as a prosthodontist, you need to basically figure out how to use all these different tools to your, to your advantage and um, provide the best treatment for your patients. So first, those are the basic ones, um, a crown, full coverage restoration. It's basically a cap on a tooth. There's a partial coverage restoration, which is veneers, basically that Hollywood smile you guys all know about. Um, fixed dental prosthesis, which is a bridge. If you've got a missing teeth, you basically prepare the adjacent teeth for crowns and you put a uh, fixed dental prosthesis or a bridge over to um, replace that missing tooth. Or removal prosthesis can be partial or it can be complete. Uh, partial if you've got um, a couple of missing teeth, but you don't have all your teeth missing. You have like a partial denture or you have a complete denture. And of course, implant restorations. Implant restorations can be a single tooth, multiple teeth, or even a full arch, which is basically you're missing all your teeth in your jaw and you're replacing that with implants and a prosthetic. So yes, so that's prosthodontics. Basically you have all these tools and all these um, items in your pocket and your patient walks in and you need to figure out how to treatment plan it, how to sequence it. Um, you obviously never want the patient to walk out of your office with no teeth. So once you prepare something, how do you provisionalize, give a temporary restoration and how to sequence things to the patient's liking, being financial. Uh, sometimes you really can't jump to the final uh, prosthetic right away because it's pretty expensive. And the patient can pay basically a certain amount with time. So you can't just jump to the final prosthesis. So all of these skills that you learn throughout your residency on how to handle those kind of, uh, those kind of uh, patients and obviously cases. So, um, I kind of divided prosthodontics into multiple different things. 
especially that I'm surgically trained, meaning that I don't just do those prosthetics, but everything that kind of sits on those prosthetics, whether it's a sinus augmentation, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, bone grafting, implants, whatever, whatever leads to the final prosthetic, I will be doing surgically as well. Um, so I basically playing the role of the oral surgeon, periodontist, um, and prosthodontist all at the same time. So let's uh, go for the most basic dental aesthetics. So something like this, this patient walks in with this temporary on this left side. Immediately, obviously, I want the patient to leave from my office as pleasant as possible. And um, basically replaced it with another, with another uh, temporary. So this is just a temporary restoration. I hand carved it with my own hands and uh, just wanted the patient while my treatment planning process, I took out the provisional or a temporary restoration, took it out, replaced it for her, made it nicer so she can actually walk out being like, okay, I left this prosthodontist in a better situation than I came in, even though it was still the first visit. Or something as simple as a single tooth. You can say, see this um, uh, lateral incisor, pretty tiny tooth, and that's just congenitally like that. And you just build it up. And this is as well, this is just a single visit with your hand and you just shape that. Uh, or it can go a little bit more. Uh, this is another patient that walked into my office, um, does not like her smile, does not like her two front uh, crowns. And, and I agree with her. And you let the patient leave with something like this, something with more, uh, more aesthetic, enjoyed her smile and uh, better for the oral health. And the, another beautiful thing about prosthodontics is that we are kind of the leaders in digital dentistry as well. Uh, being that digital dentistry is just trying to make our lives easier and faster in producing that restoration or that crown or that bridge or whatever it is. Um, so kind of prosthodontists took the lead in that. So, so with the age of technology, uh, that also went into dentistry, where, for example, this is a case uh, where the patient wanted veneers and a crown, uh, prepared the teeth, gave the patient a provisional, and scanned it with my scanner. And you can see here, this is a 3D model on the, on the computer of my preparations, and uh, 3D printed the model. So everything is complete digital workflow. And of course, gave the patient the final prosthetic. Uh, sorry, that skipped. Um, and also technology went into, into not only to teeth, but also to, uh, yeah, so that's, went into dentures as well. So now you can digitally make dentures. And the biggest advantage of this is most likely uh, patients who want dentures are usually geriatric patients, really old patients. And with geriatric patients, they forget a lot. They lose them all the time. And obviously you don't wanna waste your time doing the exact same denture over and over again and spending the patient's money. So what you do is you create digital dentures where in a click of a button, you can create the exact same replica of the denture right away. And that's how the, all this technology has been helping us a lot. And so that was the exact indication for this patient. Patients had um, minor dementia. So we decided to keep it digital. So in case she did lose her uh, denture in the future, um, we can just mill another one for her. All right, and um, like I said, with me being a um, surgical prosthodontist, um, I do everything leading up to the prosthetic. And these are a couple of surgeries, uh, different types of surgeries that lead up to the uh, prosthetic. Uh, so nothing really to do with the prosthesis. So for example, this is a patient where it had an enlargement of part of their, uh, part of their jaw and I wanted to make her make him a denture. So what I decided to do is just cut a small piece of that uh, tissue, and um, and that would make it easier for the prosthetic and um, um, better for longevity of the prosthesis. And um, same thing here. Uh, this is a patient. Sorry, I think a lot of the 
photos are going to be super bloody, so I apologize in advance. Um, so this is another uh, case where you can see the bone is very irregular and we needed to flatten things out for a better prosthetic. That's exactly what we did. We planned everything, understood exactly where I wanted my, my alveoloplasty to be, which is basically where I wanted to cut the bone. And then obviously you make it nice and smooth for the final prosthetic. Uh, even phrenectomies, uh, I'm sure you guys all see those in your mouth. Um, sometimes we gotta get rid of those because they create some recession on the teeth, uh, create some, some other issues. So you can see here how it's really coming close to the tooth um, on the left photo. And that was indicated to remove it and the orthodontist wanted me to get rid of it as well. So that's exactly what we did. Crown lengthening. Crown lengthening is exactly what it sounds like. Basically wanted to make the tooth larger. So you can see here, the teeth look small and square. Um, so basically part of that tooth is underneath the gums. And it's also my job to get, that, get the gums back to their original position or where they need to be. And of course you can see that this colored tooth needed to get that fixed. So that's exactly what I did. I lifted up the gums surgically and gave the patient two nice looking uh, prosthetics that kind of match her, her aesthetics. This is another patient that comes in, super, super gummy smile. You can see large enlargements of her gingiva, which is the gums. And um, so what I did is I exactly did what uh, you expected me to do, is just bring those gums back up, cut out the pieces that don't need to be there, and that are causing her issues. Um, so patient comes out in a healthier, healthier uh, mouth and obviously more aesthetic. Another, another case for crown lengthening, this is a little bit different approach. Uh, you can see how bulbous her gums are. So, so that's another thing with the, as, a, as a prosthodontist or even a periodontist, you gotta understand the etiology, how things came the way they are. And that's the only way you can provide a good treatment. Uh, so in this case, I didn't need to just cut the gums, but I also needed to cut the bones. So that's exactly what I did. I opened up the gums, saw all that bone. You can see how fatty the, the uh, bone looks. And I cut it down, made it nice and aesthetic, and of course, lengthened the teeth. And then the patient goes from short teeth to much longer teeth. I ended up doing veneers on this patient as well. And now, like I said, uh, as a prosthodontist, everything that leading up to the prosthesis, meaning the implant and any bone augmentation that's needed. So bone grafting. So whenever there's no bone, you wanna graft uh, the area, basically add more bone to provide an implant in the future. And so for example, here, this tooth on the left, on the, the middle tooth is there's no hope of keeping it. So what we did is wanted to maintain that bone for the future implant. And that's exactly what we did. We took this tooth out, we put some bone inside the remaining socket and closed it up and then you wait and then later on place the implant. Um, this is uh, another case uh, in the anterior mandible, which is the front parts on the bottom jaw. Um, patients needed to have some implants. It looked like there was a lot of bone from this photo. You open it up and there's a huge defect inside. So you gotta clean that up. And I did exactly that. I cleaned it up, put some bone graft in there, closed it up. So here you can see the bone graft is underneath this thing called a membrane. So you kind of roll it up in there like a sausage. And then you close it up. And then you wait some period of time and then you place your implants at a later time. And here, same thing. <coughs> But for a full arch, this is a patient where all her teeth were not restorable and we wanted to get rid of them. I took out her teeth. I put the bone graft in the areas where I took out the teeth. And then I closed it up. And we wait around like four months. And then that's when we place the implants. Uh, this is another case as well. Um, same thing, uh, patient had very deficient bone and we needed to place at least four implants in the top jaw. 
in order to hold a prosthesis. I opened it up and as you can see here, the bone is extremely thin, defective. You can see all these like kind of indentations into the bone. You obviously don't want that when you want to place some implants. Bone is super thin. So that's exactly what I did. I uh, placed some bone graft in the area and closed it up. And here's the same thing, sausage technique. So you can see how it can just basically looks like a big sausage and that's what you want. And you can see how uh, this is a follow-up. You can see the picture on the left and the right. You can see how the right one is much more bulbous because I built up all that bone. And then later on, I'm gonna open up the gums and place my implants. Now moving to the implant part. So implants are basically just a piece of titanium screw that goes into the bone. And then that needs to heal for a little bit until you place your tooth. Uh, but when it comes to implants, there's multiple different ways to place the implant. You can place the implant when there's no tooth. So for example, in this area, uh, there is no tooth and there hasn't been a tooth there for a very long time. Uh, it's something that we call delayed placement. So we basically just open up the gums, place the implant. Another technique would be waiting six weeks. So you extract the tooth, wait a little bit, then place the implant. And of course, um, something called an immediate implant where we extract the tooth and then the same day of the extraction, you place the implant. I'm gonna show you a bunch of those cases. So in this case, it's a delayed placement because as you can see the pre-op, the pre-operative photo, there's no teeth, the ridge seems very healed. Um, so we just open up the gums, place the implants and then at a later date, um, put in the crowns. Um, this is a case of an immediate uh, patient comes in. Yeah, you can see this tooth is a primary tooth. A primary tooth is basically a milk tooth uh, that's retained. Um, so what I decided to do, I wanted to take the tooth out and place the implant at the same time. So I took out the tooth, as you can see over here, and then placed on my surgical guide. This type of surgical guide is computer guided, which means that I, des I uh, took the x-ray and put it on the computer and I basically designed where, and I designed exactly where I wanted the implant to be in 3D space. And I fabricated according to that, a surgical guide, which sits on the teeth and you can place your implant. And so basically it looks like this. You place your drills into the bone and then you eventually place your implant. And then the patient leaves with the tooth in the same day. So you place the implant immediately and the tooth is immediate. So that's another thing that I was talking about earlier. As a prosthodontist, you never want the patient to leave your office unsatisfied. Meaning that you can't have them leave your office worse than they came in. So the patient actually came in with a tooth. I didn't want to take out the tooth, place an implant and not have her leave with anything. So I gave her a provisional, which is a temporary crown on the implant at the same day of the implant placement. Uh, this is another set of uh, immediate implants. Basically, you can see those two broken down teeth. Uh, what I decided to do is took out the teeth and placed my implants at the exact same time and placed something called custom healing abutment. So those basically sit in there for, for like three or four months and they maintain the shape of the, of the gums. Uh, there's also another case, two broken down teeth. You can see the extraction, took out the teeth, placed my implants. And of course, in the space, you always want to put some bone, bone grafts. And then after some time, you put in your implant crowns. Um, this is another case for as immediate, this patient comes in, these two teeth are super movable, super mobile. And so what I did is I took the teeth out without a single stitch, took the teeth out, placed my implants and left it as that. Um, what I did here as well is I, during surgery, I took a scan of the implant and this is what I have over here. That's a scan of the implant themselves. So I can provide the patient a provisional the same day as her implant placement. So basically place the implant, took a scan, sent it to the lab. The lab made me a bridge on those implants and gave it to her in the same day. 
Uh, this is a different type of implant placement. This is where we wait six weeks. You can see we took out the tooth and then after six weeks, you can see just a remaining socket. But that's basically just enough for us to place an implant. And that's exactly what we did. And to put the implant here, put our bone graft, put our membrane, close it up and wait for it to heal. Um, this is also another um, implant case, different technique. Patient wanted some implants here, but the ridge was very small. So, so as you can see here, opened up the, opened up the gums. The ridge is pretty narrow. The bone is pretty narrow. Wanted to place the implants, but did not want to augment and wait. I wanted to place my implants and augment at the same time. So that's exactly what I did. So what I did was we split the bone, basically cut it in half and expanded it. So once you make a slit into the bone and then you kind of just like hammer it open and then that kind of makes it a little bit bigger. And then with the empty spaces, and you place your implant, you can see how it kind of like got wider. Once we place the implant, that kind of pushed the bone out. And then in that empty space, you put some bone graft, close it up. Exact same technique, bone graft, close it up, let it here. Uh, now I'm going more for full arches. So you can see this and this dentalist ridge, which means a ridge with no teeth, healed, opened it up. You can see the bone. Did this case computer guided and place the implants. And then you just wait and let it heal. And then after a couple of months, you open up the gums and then you place your prosthetic. Another case, same thing, uh, this time on the bottom jaw. Opened up the gums, place our implants, and then gave the patient the final prosthesis. So you can see here the upper, this one is a denture, which is removable. And this one is on the implants that were replaced. Another, another type, so you can see the other two cases, the patient had no teeth, but we can actually also do immediate on full arches. So this is a patient that comes in, obviously those teeth look completely rotten. Took them out, opened the gums and took uh, and then place my implants into the sockets. Sorry, it's out of focus. I had my assistant take that photo. And obviously plenty, plenty more from where that came from. Um, and a lot of times nowadays with technology, all of these are computer guided. Um, a lot of times, depending on the finances, we do it computer guided. It's obviously always better because it's more precision but sometimes we just got to do it freehand, which is what we call when we just place the implants without any assistance, let's say. And of course, uh, our bread and butter, full mouth rehabilitation, whatever it may be. Uh, like I said, we have all these tools and with full mouth rehabilitation, we got to figure out how to utilize all these tools at the same time to provide our patient with the ideal, ideal treatment. So there's the patient you can see here. Um, pretty messed up teeth. And then we bring the patient into a much better situation. So you see, it's not all the same. Um, so, so in the previous cases, I kind of showed you just small uh, portions of, of those tools that we have, but um, in ultimately in big cases, it's kind of a combination of everything. So in this case, we did bridges, we did crowns, we did removal prostheses. So you see here, there's a partial denture, bottom is a bridge. So you kind of want to combine a lot of these treatments to provide the best treatment for your patients. Same thing here, this patient comes in, you can see how the jaw is protruding, has minimal space, has these um, bridges over here that are fractured. And then you take the patients to a much better situation where you place implants. So in this area, we place our implants here, we place an implant here, we place an implant here, we did a bridge here. So it's not all one treatment, you know, and that's the beauty of prosthodontics, uh, prosthodontics is that you have these tools and it's up to you to kind of figure it out for the patient. So it's never boring. And of course, dentures. Uh, patient comes in, has no teeth, and um, 
provide the patient with a beautiful smile. You know, even dentures, unfortunately, there's a stigma against dentures because it's removable. Uh, nobody wants to remove prosthesis. Every time they talk, it kind of moves, but you can actually create some pretty, pretty good aesthetics uh, from just a regular denture. And as you can see over here, um, you can combine implants and dentures. So you can see over here, there's uh, an edentalist patient and those are implants. So what we did is we basically stick the denture onto those implants. They're not fixed like the previous restorations that I showed you. Uh, it's removable, but it's like snaps on it, like a piece of Lego or like, or like a button. And, uh, and something like this, you see just regular dentures and the patient is super happy with that. And we can go into more complex stuff like here. This is basically a full mouth rehab with implants, upper and lower. And uh, all the teeth at the top are non-restorable. All of them need to come out and, and place all implants. And of course, you can provide the patient with a beautifully aesthetic restoration, all on implants. And patient's super, super happy and has a beautiful smile again. And uh, last thing I'll show you guys, this is a pretty cool video of when I was in residency. So this is the sinus augmentation. Um, it's basically when, when your maxillary sinuses, which are over here, it kind of droops and eats the bone off, off your ridge. So what you do is you kind of make a hole into the sinus and you kind of push that up and you put some bone in there, place your implants and, um, and then you wait. There's a lot of waiting in dentistry. And here you can see, this is the implant, place the implant into the bone and into the sinus at the same time. You can see that's the tip of the implant and that's a sinus looking into it, fill that up with more bone. And then you end up, and then you move on to the rest, meaning place your other implants. And you can see here, this is computer guided surgery. So like I mentioned earlier, we use a computer to fabricate this surgical guide. And then it basically assists us in putting the implants exactly where we need them to be. And here you can see those are the implants going into the bone. Boom, beautiful. And this is what we call membrane. Just, just close it up. Whenever we put bone graft, we always tend to put some, some uh, membrane over it. So that's that. Uh, thank you guys for your attention. That's my cute little puppy. And uh, if anybody has any questions, the floor is open. Thank you so much for sharing. I feel like I learned so much. Um, we can start with the Q&A section. Um, we usually ask everyone like how COVID-19 has affected your practice. Um, if you want to elaborate okay. on it. <laughs> Very good question. Um, it's in April and May, uh, we did not close, we did not close completely. Uh, in our practice, we stayed open seeing emergency patients only. And um, so we were basically on call. So every day there was, a, there was one doctor. So we're a practice of seven doctors. And uh, every day there was one doctor that was in the office to see any patients, any walk-in patients, and one dentist that's also on call. So obviously it affected us a lot because there wasn't a lot of patients, but we wanted to provide the service for our community. And then June came along and June and July were basically great months. Everybody was sick of COVID, everyone wanted to get their teeth done. Um, I feel like we were not affected by COVID that much. I don't know if you guys heard anything about Abu Dhabi or the UAE in general. Uh, thankfully, we have been doing very well with COVID, um, but our restrictions were huge. Uh, our restrictions were we had curfew from day one, like um, we had curfew starting March. March, we weren't allowed to leave the house after um, 7 p.m. Uh, we, we have to take PCRs every single week. 
So every single week we have to get tested. Uh, we're basically all vaccinated now. I think 6 million people in the UAE are already vaccinated out of 9 million. Um, so everything we kind of, uh, honestly, I have to say like the government did such a great job, uh, especially seeing the chaos in all other countries in Europe and the States <laughs> as well. Um, but we basically were closed or not even closed. Like, um, we did not work that much in April and May, uh, starting in June, we we're basically back to normal. Uh, but with a ton of precautions, um, uh, we, like I said, we get tested PCR every single week. Uh, we got, we, because we were healthcare professionals, we got vaccinated back in June. Um, we, um, all our patients have to show proof of PCR before any surgery. Um, so it was like, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty intense. Um, whenever you leave state lines, you have to get tested. Uh, whenever you come back to your own home state in, in the United Arab Emirates, you have to get tested on the fourth day and the eighth day again. So it's insane. So like right now, as of today, I think I had like 40 or 50 PCRs, <laughs> which is an insane amount. Yeah. Um, cool. But in general, in general, our practice was not affected that much uh, because everybody was super compliant. Nobody complained uh, that they had to get PCRs. Nobody complained about anything. Everybody just went with the flow and knew that it was the best thing for them. That's nice to hear. I wish it was like that here. <laughs> <laughs> um, another yeah. question that we usually ask is, do you have any like advice that you would tell to your younger self um, if you could go back and kind of talk to yourself? Um, advice is um, tell my younger self. I think I uh, took life too seriously. <laughs> I was a super, super, super nerd. I still am, um, but it's it's good. But also, I wish I liked it easy a little bit. <laughs> I see. Um, yeah. So, so in the end of the day, I would say quality of life is very important. That's why I I brought up that U.S. news rankings. In the end of the day, I went into dentistry for the quality of life. Uh, that's how it started because obviously nobody, no 17 year old tells themselves, hey, um, I want to be a dentist because I love dentistry. It's, it's never like that. It's about security. It's about uh, being financially independent. It's about being your own boss. And it's about, it's about, is it something that you can love, especially in healthcare? I knew I wanted to go into healthcare. Um, and then, you know, you look into it and it has a great work-life balance if you want to. I'm a workaholic. I work 12 to, 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, but, but if you want to, you don't need to work that much. You know, we have dentists here that work three, day, three hours a day. And, you know, it's up to them. They do whatever they want. You know, they're all in percentages. You make what you get. Um, so, so it's a great work-life balance um, if you wanted to, if you wanted to have that. As opposed, for example, like my brother, my brother is a bariatric surgeon. Obviously, being a medical surgeon is is a whole different field. You know, it's uh, way more intense. You're not in charge of your schedule. You get on calls. Uh, you get called into the hospital in the middle of the night. Dentistry, we get to do all these cool surgeries. At least I wanted to do. I wanted to be more surgically oriented. Uh, yet you. Um, still have that work-life balance. Um, another question that we got, I guess it's a clarifying question, but how many degrees do you have in total? Oh, man. Uh, not a lot. <laughs> I have uh, two doctorates and a certificate in prosthodontics and a master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, why did you choose prosthodontics in comparison in comparison to other specialties? Um, how did you know that this was what you wanted to do? Very good question. So, so I always had an eye for aesthetics, uh, meaning that I had an eye for you know, um, and I was really good with my hands, uh, being that you know I'm able to create 
teeth from nothing, um, from just imagining it like in 3D space. Um, but I did not want to not do surgery. Uh, so initially when I was in dental school, I wanted to be an oral maxillofacial surgeon because I loved surgery. Um, but I, I really got into the prosthetic part, meaning that the smile uh, and everything that comes with that and the complexity that comes with that. And so I did not want to give up surgery and I did not want to give up the, the prosthetic parts, the smile part, the wow factor. And prosthodontics was ideal for me, especially surgical prosthodontics, because you get to do that whole wow factor, bring a patient from no teeth to full teeth and a beautiful smile and do all the surgeries related to it. But I have to say, not all prosthodontists are like me, uh, meaning that not, not a lot of prosthodontists are surgically trained. I was very fortunate that I went to a program that was surgically oriented. Uh, I don't know if you guys had other prosthodontists come in to do these lectures. Uh, not a lot of them will show a lot of surgeries uh, and big surgeries like, like this. Um, it was just a passion of mine since the beginning. I knew I went into prosthodontics being like, I need to go to a surgically oriented program um, and I want to be better at surgery. So, so I took it upon myself to, to take that extra step. Um, do you use automated or robot assisted surgery tools in the office? Um, I, do, I don't do robotic. Uh, which is the new technology. I, I don't do that. It's uh, way too expensive. I think the machine costs $150,000. Um, yeah. Um, so I'd rather buy myself a Ferrari than spend $150,000. <laughs> um, but I do computer assisted like those cases that I showed you. So basically what you do is you take a scan of the patient's mouth and you take the x-ray and you combine those two together and then you digitally design or place your implant and then you create that assistance um, but patients have to pay for that so a lot of times patients don't want to pay for that um, so you have to have the skills to kind of do it yourself which is what we call freehand um how can a pre-dental student make their dental school application competitive um i would say extracurriculars are are big um i feel like i was part of like the committee for the acceptance for the school. So I kind of saw what they were looking for, especially I had an had a unconventional path being that I went to dental school twice, uh, but extracurricular was huge and being social. In the end of the day, being a dentist, you gotta be social. You're, you're a psychologist as well. Talking to these patients, uh, a lot of them are scared. A lot of them are frightened. They like, look at your Instagram and they see all the blood on your Instagram. They're like, what the hell does this guy do? You know, he's going to like rip my mouth apart. So patients nowadays are more educated and, and more aware of what we do. Um, so, so being social and being able to get along with everybody and the way you do that or the way you show that on your application is through extracurricular activities and good letters of recommendation. I think those two are special letter recommendation are extremely important, especially if there's a specific school that you want to go to, try to find a dentist that's an alumni of that school and that'll be huge. Um, in which situation would one prefer dentures over implants? Never, it's finances. One costs $2,000 and the other one costs $50,000. <laughs> we everybody wants to go for implants but it's a complete it's it's most likely a financial aspect okay so we have a few critical questions right here in the case where the milk tooth remain um is the mm -hmm. is the adult tooth missing completely as in yes. never growing under the gums at all Yes, it was, it was what we call congenitally missing. So, so the patient never got that tooth. Uh, she was never born with it. And in the case where the patient gets the bridge in the same day, how do you keep the patient in the office? Um, were they sedated and was there pain for the patient? Uh, very good question. Um, it's uh, 
we don't sedate that much. Uh, I know in the States here, at least here in the, in the UAE, we don't sedate that much. It's mostly on local, um, but uh, the lab is in-house. Um, so basically it, it gets done in like 15 minutes. Uh, so the patient just waits for it. Wow, I didn't know it was that fast, 15 minutes. That is awesome. <laughs> Uh, for bone grafting, where do you usually get the bone if there is a deficiency? Um, mainly from a vial. <laughs> so, so mainly there's, there's different types of uh, bone, uh, meaning uh, bone from animals and bone from other humans, like cadavers. Um, so each one has its own indication because the body responds differently to each one. Um, but we usually use either of those combined with the patient's own bone. So because we have the, the bone basically exposed, we take a little chips of bone, we kind of like scrape off some of the patient's own bone because studies have shown that that's the best. And we combine it with the bone from the vial and then we just place it on there. And then we usually wait around four to six months. It's, it's a long time. That is very cool. Um, so, Someone asked, how did you learn the business aspect of dentistry? Um, very good question. The business aspect of dentistry was learned the most in private practice. Um, I work purely on percentage. So yes, I work with my dad, but I get a certain percentage of my own revenue um, minus, ex minus expenses. So with time, you kind of be like, okay, you know what? I'm paying too much for the lab. I am paying too much for this implant. I'm gonna try to lower my cost so I can make more. I'm going to be more efficient. I'm gonna use the tools that I have, for example, digital dentistry. Instead of wasting, wasting material to take an impression, I'm gonna do it digitally so that will cut costs. And, and ultimately on the big scale, I'm looking into the whole practice as well because I not only manage my own clinic, but I manage the entire practice being seven other doctors and another branch. So, so you kind of like need to learn it on yourself before you can implement it on others. So I would say the best way to learn business is just, there's no, there's no book. There really is no book for this. As much as there, people try to sell you, books like these, which I, I do read, um, it's, it's useless. Um, it's useless unless you're trying, to, you're trying to write up a business plan. That's a whole different aspect of it. Uh, if you're trying to build up a business plan and know how to write it, uh, send out a loan, go to the bank, like that kind of stuff, yes, you can read that from a book. Uh, but the actual dental business aspect of it and try to be more efficient and cut costs and increase quality, increase amount of patients, all that stuff is purely just experience. It comes with time. And the more, the smarter you are about it, the faster you're going to learn. Uh, a lot of doctors we have here, like we have one doctor that's not into business whatsoever. And his revenue is always the lowest because he's just not interested in, in, becoming faster he's not interested he's like you know what i don't want to become faster like my goal is i want to maintain my quality and be faster you know as as an individual i want to get the same results but lower my costs some dentists are just not interested in that and and that's ultimately what differentiates an employee from a business owner in my opinion uh, having having that mindset and some, some people are just not cut out for it. Um, from my experience, some people are just born to be employees and some people are just born to be free employers. <laughs> and in the same vein, we have a question on how hard was it to pay off dental school debt for you? Um, not very hard. I obviously got a lot of help from my family, um, but, but in general, being a dentist, this, this is why it's also important to look at how much you're going to be making. If, if according to US News, which is a low ball um, and it's a median, um, you make 208K, you know, in a couple of years, you're gonna pay those off. 
And we but have also, an, go, go ahead, go ahead. Add, add, um, you also need to be smart, uh, meaning that when you graduate and you have you're starting to get those big paychecks and you're eligible to go buy yourself a Porsche, don't do it. <laughs> um, because you know, just pay off the loans, get it done, and that's basically what happened. Just pay, pay them off, then start enjoying your life. And we have another clinical question here. What function does the membrane serve in the case of bone grafting? Oh man, that's a good question. I didn't think you, I'm gonna get that from you guys. I think um, you were referring to when, um, I think you had that picture with the uh, the membrane open and then you stuck in something, yeah, the, the white membrane yes. and pull it down. I think, yeah. Yeah, so, so the membrane basically bone heals much slower than your gums. How many times did you get a cut in your gums and after a week, it's fine? Um, so, so your gums heal much, much faster than bone. So you don't want that gum to, to heal onto your bone. So you kind of want to separate the two. So, so that membrane kind of separates and lets the bone heal alone and the gums heal alone. So it's basically just a barrier. But really good question. Okay, we have a few more questions from the live. Um, one of them was, um, why did you decide to practice in the UAE um, after getting your training from the US? Um, very good question. Um, I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> Um, I think the biggest thing is income is really good here, revenue is really good here, and I don't pay taxes. I think that was my final decision is uh, zero taxation, meaning that every single procedure I do, every single cent I make goes straight to my pocket. Um, and, um, and family. My, all my brothers went to school in the States as well. Um, and they moved back and then they kind of convinced me to move back. Even though I was like so adapted, I, I, I started my job and everything in New York City. And then I decided to, um, to just leave everything behind and come here. Uh, but having said that, I still maintain my license in the States. Um, so, so, you know, my, my future goal, the reason I do that is my future goals is to open up a practice in the States uh, while maintaining the practices over here. Um, so that's, that's future goals. Wow, thank you. That's super impressive. Um, another <laughs> question that we got in the chat was, um, I hear that a lot of dentists say it's hard working long hours and it's really physical straining. Um, how do you deal with physical issues and do you have any, any tips for health or posture? Uh, yes, I recently changed my practice to standing up. I, I'm, I don't sit down anymore. Um, so I think that's really helped me a lot with my posture um, and with my back pain. Uh, I was leaving residency and I already had back pain and I was like, oh my God, I got like 10 years of dentistry in me. Uh, but the second I started uh, practicing while standing up the whole time, my assistant hates it, but, but it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. Um, but I think that's really helped me and it is very straining. Um, I also do a lot of stretching in between patients and, and during patients. During patients, I literally like do all my like neck stretches and my back stretches. And uh, it's actually pretty funny because when I do that, I do that just to kind of like release the tension. But then afterwards, my patient looks at me and be like, oh my God, you got really tired. Thank you so much for spending the time treating me. And I don't know what, I'm like, oh man, I didn't really mean to show you that I'm tired, but, uh, but thank you for the appreciation. I, I felt when I started doing that more, like, like intra-procedural uh, stretching, patients started appreciating my work more, which is so weird. <laughs> So those are two tips. Awesome. That's really funny. And logistically, do you just like elevate the patients more or how does that work? Yes. 
Yes. So basically the chair goes really high, actually. Like the dental chair goes really high. And, and I'm not really tall. I'm like five nine. Um, so so it's 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 works, it works out. Uh, and plus you wear loops. So so we have our magnific magnification. So that kind of like like kind of prevents you from getting close to the patient. And and that's also very important now with COVID because you want to stay away from the patient. That's really cool. I've never heard of a dentist that that's done that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Um, another question we got was, how are you able to work on your dexterity skills? Um, practice, literally. And um, even as a dentist, even as a prosthodontist, even as a practicing dentist. So for example, if you take a look over here, I'm gonna to move my camera. You can see the small models on my desk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring one of them over. So you can see over here, even when I don't have a patient, I'm practicing my sutures, I'm practicing my stuff, I'm always just keeping my hand busy. And that's the thing with dentistry. Dentistry is a hand skill. And that's the first thing I insured is my hands. <laughs> awesome, I love that. And then um, another question we got in the chat was um, referring to what you mentioned earlier. Um, so after it's healed, do you remove the membrane when you were talking about? No, no, that's resorbable. Uh, that's, that's the word for it, meaning that your body absorbs it. So, uh, so ha having said that, there's also another technique where you put a non-resorbable, but that has a different indication. I don't really want to complicate things. <laughs> okay. Thanks for clarifying. And then... Um, the last question that we do have in the chat that we'll go ahead and close our session with um, is kind of non-dental related, but how do you enjoy life in Abu Dhabi and kind of like, what's your work-life balance like? Um, you know, it's extremely ironic that I keep saying that I went to dentistry for the work-life balance, but I have no work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult for me at this point in time because uh, I'm, I'm still at the beginning of my career. I'm practicing eight hours a day, managing a practice of seven people, opening up another branch, uh, we're still working on my startups. I put that a little bit on pause for now. Um, and just having time for my puppy has been difficult lately. <laughs> I got to be very, very honest. Um, but once things start becoming more self-sustaining, so my goal, my personal goal is uh, trying to make this place function without me. Um, meaning that I'm trying to I'm have a manager, I have a clinic manager, and I'm trying to train her to think like me. So when I'm in the other branch, she can think like me and have things self-sufficient. Uh, especially going with my long-term goals of opening up practices in the States as well, that needs to happen. Um, so now for the smaller scale, I need this place to run by itself. I want the other branch to run by itself and the third branch and so on and so forth. Um, so as of now, I'm taking the hit for having no work-life balance, but hopefully, you know, right now I... Um, I'm, I'm engaged, but my wife, is, my fiance is still in the States. She's in Philly. And uh, so right now I'm basically by myself. Uh, so, so she's going to be moving here soon uh, once we get married. And um, so as of now, I have no work-life balance to answer your question. Uh, but I'm working on it by trying to make the business run on its own so I can have more time for myself and for my puppy. And my fiance, sure. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Uh, since that was the final question, um, do you have any closing remarks for the watchers, for, for the viewers at home? Um, closing remarks. Uh, I would say dentistry is an amazing job. It really is. Uh, the most beautiful thing about dentistry, whatever specialty you do, um, is 
honestly, again, it's ironic, but the work-life balance. Uh, you can do part-time, full-time. You can do one day a week. You can do six days a week. I do six days a week. I only have Fridays off. Um, and, um, and that's the beauty of it, especially in the future. You got to think about family. You got to think about all that stuff. Um, it's, um, it's, it's truly a really, really good job. And the compensation is really good too. Um, and no two cases are the same. You don't get bored of it. You really don't get bored of it. And that's ultimately where it is. You know, we always hear about, um, those jobs on desks where you're just sitting on a desk and on a computer all day, every day five days a week, you know, this one, you're, you're entertaining, you're analyzing patients, your every case is different than the other, you take photos, you self-improve, you work with your hands. Um, it, it truly is a, is a beautiful uh, career. And I, I do highly recommend it for anybody and everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. That's why I wanted to do this lecture. Uh, because I kind of wanted to put that out there and be like, more people need to be dentists because it really is such an amazing job. We have a lot of thanks in the chat for you. And one, congr congratulations on your engagement. And uh, oh, with, that, with that, the uh, session is now finished. Um, I will thank you. The chat. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>